All right, Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Now, the Bible is a textbook in demonology. And throughout this message, I'll refer to these things as demons, but technically that isn't a Bible term. The term demon doesn't occur anywhere in a King James Bible. You folks talk about demon possession. They say, well, a uh, demon obsession, demon oppression, demon possession. Some guy got a little homiletical alliteration there for an outline. People have been using it ever since like it was doctrine, but it's not. Uh, the Bible doesn't ever speak of demons. There are no demons in that book. The Bible says devils. The two things you're going to find out about that book that are shocking. The first one is that there are no demons in it. They're called devils. The second thing you're going to find shocking about that book, if you read it, is that every devil or demon-possessed person in that book is a fundamentalist. <laughs> now you think I'm just pulling your leg, don't you? Okay, look down verse 6, 7, and 8. Look down there. See, 6, 7, and 8. He ran to him and worshipped him, right? And said, uh, what have I to do with Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I drew thee God by... Every demons us person in that book knows that Christ is God's son. If there's any question about it. James says one time, James says, uh, you believe there's one God, thou doest well, the devils believe and tremble. Isn't that something? Now, you know, why, you'd think that demons us people are atheists. There are no atheists in that Bible of demons possessed. Why, you take that woman in Acts chapter 19 that has that spirit of divination. She's going up and down there saying, these uh, men uh, are, uh, show us the way of salvation. She, was, she said, these fellows here show us the way to the Most High God, which was the truth. Why, they're all that way. That demon-possessed man, where they cast the demons out over there, those exorcists, that demon says, Paul, I know, and Jesus, I know. Do you know Jesus? Yeah. So does the devil. Get mighty quiet in here. You see, I shocked you too quick. You weren't ready for it. <laughs> you know why you're not ready for it? You're not reading that book. If you're reading that book, you know I just told you the truth. Strange business, boy. Oh, I know you take that passage right there. Come down there in verse 1 and 2. They came over to the other side of the sea, the country of the Gadarenes. They met him out of the tombs, a man. And this man here had an unclean spirit. Now look on down there and notice that unclean spirit, singular, is called unclean spirits, or spirits, on down there further. Then pick up it up about verse 15 to 17, and verse 14, 15, 16 along in there. Notice further that that fellow is said to be possessed with the devil. Now look at the wording, possessed with the devil. It doesn't say deem possessed. That term deem possessed, that's a Hollywood term. You both talk about demon possession. There's no such thing as demon possession. The fellow's possessed with the devil. That's what the passage says. So when we talk about these things. I may use the term demon, but technically that isn't the right term. Technically the right term is possessed with the devil. Devil possession. Now I don't know what will go wrong in this message, but I preached this message and had the lights dim and come on off of the message. I preached this message and had the ladder fall over. I preached this message and had all the lights in the building go out. I preached this message one time up in Holland, Michigan, and when I got through preaching, the guy said, uh, come on downstairs in the basement, I want to have you hear something. Must have been about, oh, about an hour after the message was over, and he took me down to the basement and played me back a tape of the message I'd preached, and he used a brand new tape and de it just to make sure it was had nothing on it. He plugged into a private line where he'd get it direct off the mic, nothing coming in, and recorded that thing, but he turned that thing on. Every time I'd speak, you'd hear a voice behind mine. Now, when I'd stop, the voice behind mine would stop. Now I'd go, then the voice would start again. And the voices behind mine, you had to listen. You had to get there real close, a pair of earphones, and check, see what was going on. But those were different voices. It wasn't one person, eight or nine people. And those things were short-wave uh, radio broadcasts between two squadrons of planes that were uh, putting off an attack of Russian MiGs on Alaska and California. That's what's coming through that line. Wildest thing you ever heard in your life. All this technical language, technical language. I mean, it's, uh, air, uh, military stuff. I didn't even understand. I knew it was technical language. All through that thing. Strange things. Strange things. Now this here is talking about a man who is possessed with the devil. Hollywood believes in demons and devils. They have the exorcist, you know, and the omen, you know, and Rosemary's baby. And some of you Christians go around and lock that stuff up like a 
cow looking up black strap molasses. Yeah. Every time somebody puts a Hollywood title on it that's biblical, you run off to see it and think you're going to see the Bible. <laughs> well, you, it's a perversion of the Bible. They never get the Bible right. You get a demon possessed person, you don't get devils out of somebody by holding up a wooden cross, you know, throwing salt on them. The devil collects wooden crosses. He got all kinds. He got all kinds of wooden crosses. I mean, there's a fellow out in Kansas right now putting on a big show, and he's putting out tapes all over this country on how to cast demons out of people. And he's getting these little 10 year old girls and 6 year old girls, means women, usually it's women, and the little kids arguing with him, Come out, I won't. Come out, I will not. I command them to I remember, come out. <laughs> Listen, stupid. I mean, some of you, if you took a pistol home and loaded it with six shots and fired at your brain three times, you'd miss all three times. <laughs> there isn't, there isn't, listen, there isn't one person in that book that spends any time arguing with an unclean spirit. Right. Right. He says, get out, and they get out. All this talking back and forth. Then going back the next day, another session. The next day, he came back in him. <laughs> Where do you get that stuff from? You don't get that out of Scripture. Well, in this place here, he talks with the demon, that fellow, for a while. But when he says, get, they go. No fooling around. Paul tells, come out of him now, unclean spirit. That woman over there in Acts 16, they're out of her. There's no argument. You see, the thing is, it's the company you keep. <laughs> like the fellow was talking about the boob tube. You've been around that idiot box for so long, you just pick up all kinds of ideas. You're the book preach. You said it's not the book. That is the book. You've just been looking at the wrong Bible. That's the problem. Now, you know why the King James translator said it was devils and not demons? Because the King James translators knew that all demons were bad. You see, the old Greek philosophers, Hesoid and uh, Plato and that bunch, you know what they taught? They taught that some demons were good, kind of like white magic. As a matter of fact, they taught that... Uh, they taught that if you had a genius, you had a special demon nobody else had that gave you special revelations nobody else had. That's what they believed. So when the King James translators came the passage, they had good sense, and they translated the word daimonion as devil every time it showed up. And when the scholars stepped in, they said, why, that isn't right. There's only one God, one, one devil, but many demons. How many of you ever heard that? Let me see your hand. That's standard seminary baloney. Now listen, how many of you here this morning are sons of God? Could I see your hands? I thought there was just one son of God. You see, there's the son of God and they're sons of God. How many of you believe that there's one God? Let me see your hand, one God. Okay, but the devil is called the God of this world, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. You see, there's one God, but many gods. There's one Lord, but many lords. There's one Son of God, but many sons of God. There's one angel of the Lord, but many angels of the Lord. There's one devil, but many devils. Turn to John chapter 6 and look at verse 70 and 71. John chapter 6, verse 70 and 71. Nothing like a book to clear up a seminary education. You say, well, Dr. Swindle and Dr. MacArthur, ha let the kiddies stay in the crib, okay? Amen. Well, let them suck, suck their bottles. Amen. Pick your Bible and turn to John chapter 6, verse 70 to 71. Their interest in amateur counseling or amateur psychology have nothing to do with the Word of God. John chapter 6, verse 70 to 71. Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is what? Amen. What? Amen. Again. Amen. Louder. Amen. Is it the devil? It's a devil, right? Then there's more than one devil. You'll be able to figure that thing out. Some of you say, well, didn't the devil enter him? Yeah, but that's John 13. You're not in John 13. You're in John chapter 6. So they call these things devils. Oh, I keep on reading there. They met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. And the Bible said he'd uh, been bound with chains. They'd been broken, bound with fetters and chains. And he broke them asunder, and neither can any man tame him. And it goes on down there and it says, always day and night, he was in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. That place late at night. That fellow is, is a maniac, and he's possessed with the devil. I learned something else about him. In Luke chapter 8, verse 27, I learned additional piece of information that he was naked. He had no clothing. 
Now I'll put a loincloth on him for the sake of decency, but this guy is a streaker. <laughs> He's a flasher without the cover up. He doesn't have anything on. He's just running around naked. You know, what, you know what one of the first things God does to a fellow when he gets him right? Look at verse 17. Or verse 15. Or verse 15 of all. You see that, that fellow when he got right? What happened to him? He got clothed. Sitting and clothed and in his right mind. You know the first thing that God did to Adam and Eve when he drove them out of the garden? They had put, he put clothing on them. He said, those fig leaves won't do it. It isn't modest. <laughs> Clothe them with sheepskin. All this stuff with women's dress, I know how it goes. I preach all over the country. I'm up in the hills of Carolina. Lackey, Carl Lackey, North Carolina, that bunch. And I'm down the plains, California, and, and, the, and the Rocky Mountains. My parish goes from Miami to Seattle and from Bangor, Michigan to San Diego someplace. And they have all kinds of feelings about this thing. That verse that brother gave you in clothing is the best one in the Bible. Modest. That's the best. You can't go by anything else. Amen. Somebody said, well, if we, women shouldn't. I, listen, I've been to youth camps. They said, well, it's a sin for the women to wear slacks. They've got to wear dresses. So they wore dresses. They were six inches above the knee. And the next year they said, wear dresses down below your knees. They did. They were tighter than a scuba diver's outfit. <laughs> Then they said, wear thick dresses below your knees, and they wore uh, long dresses, you know, loose dresses below your knees. Then they had them so thin a mosquito could fly through without breaking a wing. <laughs> now, now, sister, let me tell you something. If you're carnal, you're carnal. And you'll find some way to attract attention to yourself instead of the Lord. We had a youth director come to us from Texas. He was, boy, he was death on, he was, he was death, man, any kind of slacks, jeans or matador britches or whatever you call them. I mean, he was on anything. And he came to me and resigned one time, and I said, what are you resigning for? He said, well, you and I don't have the same convictions. I said, I gave you the youth department to handle it according to your own convictions. And I give a fellow a job, he's got the job. Uh, Brother McGee has been my associate pastor for about 12 years. He'll be going back Saturday morning and take the pulpit to Sunday, I won't ask him what he's going to preach when he goes. won't check on him after he's been there preaching. I've got a man I can trust. If I, don't, if I can't trust a guy, I won't give him nothing to do. If I can trust a guy, he's got it. I don't even check on him if he's doing it right. I know he's doing it right. I know he's doing it right. Never have to worry about somebody coming to him and saying, well, Brother McGay, he, uh, Brother Ruckman's a fine man, but he just can't really preach, you know. He's a great Bible teacher, but, but you are the preacher, you know. See, you know. <laughs> Christians are such nice people. <laughs> you can't bug me. Listen, as long as the Lord being good to me, I don't care how it goes. My kids are in good health and saved, and I got food in my belly and money in the bank and a home in heaven and a place to preach. I ain't going to worry about nothing. Amen. Now look at here. You take this business here we're talking about. These things here, these things here are demons. When they get in people, they want to take the clothes off. You know, wear the old tank shirt, you know, the hauler, you know, show the girls your pretty belly. And your... I mean, men do the same thing. Some of you fellows couldn't play in the ball team if you had to wear long pants. <laughs> This youth fellow down here, the Pentecostal, he got them going. He finally got them all in dresses, you know. You know what happened? They had a canoe trip. <laughs> and the first canoe that went over was this guy and his wife. I mean, skirts in the air, legs flying, all those kids just laughing. What a thing, man. <laughs> Do you know how to be clothed in modest apparel while you're playing softball? Did you ever see a girls team playing the softball with skirts? I've seen it. You talk about something immodest, man. My stars. <laughs> Modesty, lady, means something that doesn't attract attention. Amen. Now, you just like that, you'll be saved, otherwise you won't. <laughs> oh, and he was sitting and clothing in his right mind when he got right. Now, I hear he's naked. I learned something else about this fellow. There's a corollary to this thing in Matthew. And in Matthew, I read there wasn't just one of them there, there was two of them there. 
You see, that's how it is with blind Bartimaeus. When Mark talks about blind Bartimaeus, he makes you think of just one there. And it says, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the wayside begging. But in Matthew, in the corollary to it, it says there were two blind men. So Matthew gives you the number, and Mark gives the details of one. You know, there are too many acts there, because when the pigs all run down the sea, there are 2,000. You know what that means? That means each one of these fellows had a thousand demons in him, or a thousand devils. Well, they must be pretty small. Mary Magdalene had seven. Folks, well, I believe those uh, demons, you know, those are the spirits of fallen angels. That won't work. That won't work. Mark chapter 3 says, The sower sows the seed, and some fell by the wayside. Listen, and the fowls of the air picked it up. Jesus, what's the sower? He's me. Jesus, what's the seed? It's the word of God. Jesus, what are the fowls? Satan. Now the devil is manifest on this earth as an unclean spirit. Like God's spirit in this earth is the Holy Spirit. The devil's spirit in this earth is the unclean spirit. That unclean spirit is made up of spirits, plural. And those spirits are called devils. They have wings. They have wings. So where do you get that from? Clean through there. Did you ever read over there in Matthew chapter 12 when they get accused of Jesus Christ? This man doesn't cast out devils by the Spirit of God, but by the Prince of Devils. You know who the Prince of Devils was? Beelzebub. You know what Beelzebub is? He's the Lord of the flies. He's the God of filth. You know what a fly is? It's a picture of a demon. <laughs> Some of you got them in your head. <laughs> Listen, you think I'm pulling your leg? You ever hear this? He got bats in the belfry. You know what the Germans say? They say, Er hat ein Vogel. He's got a bird. Your expression is bird brain. Some of you folks watch Alfred Hitchcock just like you thought the birds was something original. There's nothing original about the birds or the bird man of Alcatraz or Jonathan Seagull. Nothing original. You get a King James Bible, it'll all come real clear. Except the trouble is that King James Bible puts the negative thing on it, you see. You doubt that demons are unclean spirits are like devils? Let me put this one to you. Christ being baptized, down comes the Holy Spirit in the form of a what? You see that thing? You see that thing? Those birds are types of spirits. Didn't you read that thing in Leviticus chapter 11? There's a whole list of unclean spirits in Leviticus chapter 11. They're called unclean birds. Didn't you read Revelation chapter 18? Babylon has become the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Come out. Types of the devil. Did you ever see a mosquito? It's a blood sucker. You get a thousand things in you the size of a fly or a mosquito. Did you ever read Ecclesiastes chapter 10? Don't curse the rich in your thought. Don't curse the king in your bedchamber. For that which hath it, wings shall carry it, and a bird of the air shall tell the matter. What do you ladies say? A little bird told me. <laughs> That's what you got. This old boy here has a thousand. Has a thousand. Why, you know, you're raised in an age, you're raised in a day and age when people just don't think. They go to the radio and click the knob and expect it to turn on and adjust the volume and find the station. They go to the television thing and click the knob, pick up the channel and adjust the color. You ever stop think what you're doing? You got a shortwave radio right here in your hand like this, you take a thing like that and put it behind you and it changes from Brussels to Paris. You put it down like that, walk away from it, and the static comes in, you walk back, and the static clears up. Did you ever do that with the radio? You know what's happening? The fellow's voice is going through your body. You say literally? Yeah, literally. Here's a fellow in New York. I'm in Pensacola. Take Richter. He sits down and plays the piano. Beethoven a sonata or a piano concerto. He sits down and plays the emperor concerto. He's banging away on the piano. The auditorium is 200 feet long. I'm in Pensacola. I hear him hit the key before the guy in the back of the auditorium hears him hit the key. Yes, sir. Yeah. Some of you folks got the strangest look on your face. <laughs> you see, you just don't think. 
Those electromagnetic waves I'm getting, they come at the speed of light. That fell in the back of the auditorium getting the sound waves. I get it before he gets it. You know what that means? Right through this building, through your head, through your body, there are about 16 television channels going, and about 25 AM stations, and about 10 FM stations, and that stuff is right in this room while I'm talking to you. Going right through your head. <laughs> you, know, you know why people can sit through a service like this, or like what you've been to this week, and never amount to anything? And they can. I wish to God they couldn't, but they can. I hate to say it, but I've had young men come out of my school and they get exposed to the Bible till it just came running out their ears. And they got out, they just went right back like a hog to the wallow, never amounted to nothing. You say, how is that? There's something in the air, brethren. There's something in the air. Christ kept saying, he that hath the ears to hear, let him hear. Why did he say They weren't listening. They were listening to something else. <laughs> You get fooled around with drugs, and the first thing you know, you're getting three channels mixed, and you can't separate them. I mean, the checkerboard falls over the building, goes off in a wave, and busts in the sky rockets, and they come down the green frogs, and they hop around in front of the freight train, and it goes, whoop, and comes up here and turns into a licorice stick and goes over the side of a cliff. You just can't get the channel straightened out, man. You're having a bad trip. <clears throat> okay, this fellow is naked, and he abode a long time in the tomb. That tells me something else. That tells me demon possessed people have an affinity for corpses. Christ says, let the dead bury the dead. Christ says, or uh, well, Paul says, she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she yet liveth. Christ says, I am come that might have life and have it more abundantly. Demon possessed people have an affinity for corpses, for dead people. You had a fellow up in Minnesota, I saw it in Life magazine about 20 years ago. They caught a fellow up there and they got him. He had cadavers in his ice house. In his ice house, he had a piece of people cut up, dead bodies hanging around, eating them. That's more than a mental problem, brother. That's demons. Now, I'm not saying all people in a sanitarium are demon-possessed. I'm not saying that. But sometimes that has a lot to do with it. You take down there in Pensacola, we got a graveyard over there about a mile from our school. At one time there about 17 years ago, they buried a little old girl 12 years old in that graveyard. And the next day after that funeral, they got out that graveyard and found somebody dug up that grave and opened that casket. And there were teeth marks in that little girl's body. Human teeth marks. The ghoul. Somebody said, just mental. you got to be have something wrong with you more than mentally to get into that kind of stuff there. Hanging out with dead people. That isn't all. And always night and day. Did you notice that? Night and day. I mean, a real man that's demon-possessed doesn't wait till the sun goes down to raise hell. He'll raise hell day and night. Night and day, he was in the tombs and the mountains. The mountains. High places. Demons have an affinity for high places. You're most likely to find demons at uh, Houston where they're trying to get up to the moon without God. The devil said, I will ascend and put my throne above the stars of God. That's where you find them, high places, in the mountains. I learned something else. I learned from over there in Matthew chapter 16, the demoniac people have an affinity for warm, wet places. When Christ came down that mountain, the man said, Lord, I hear my son here. This devil often throws him into fire and water. Didn't you read over there in Matthew chapter 12 where Christ said, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, listen, and wanders through dry places and finds no rest, I'll go back and return to my place I came out of. Why? Your body's 85% water. That's why. You take Stuart Custer, that wimp up at Bob Jones, and I say that with charity, <laughs> put out a little book and it said uh, the truth about the authorized version and lied 13 times in 35 pages. One of those chapters, he says, he has a chapter that Ruckman's peculiar teachings. One of Ruckman's peculiar teachings is the demons have an affinity for warm, wet places. You say, what did you do to refute the teaching? Nothing. He didn't know enough Bible to refute the teaching. He doesn't quote any scripture. You know why? He doesn't know any scripture. If I could refute a man's false teaching of scripture, I'd get out of the ministry. Qualif qualification to preach. Hey, son, you know what's in that verse? Apt to teach. Amen. That's not verse. Sure take some of these qualifications from them quick. Fire, water. Why is that? Because all demons wind up in a lake 
of fire. If you want to fight a bunch of demons, I could tell you where to go if you're interested in them. I ain't interested in them. I've been around enough of them long enough to satisfy me for a lifetime, brother. But I know where to go. Warm, wet places. You want to get a demon, demoniac place? Los Angeles. San Diego. New Orleans. Houston. Miami. Cairo. Suez. Manila. Hong Kong. Honolulu. That's the places. That's the places. They have an affinity for warm, wet places. You take, uh, say, what do you mean you've had experience? I'm conscious of the stuff all the time. I guess it just doesn't, doesn't particularly upset me. I mean, I, I take for granted during the daytime, any Christian probably picks up several hundred demons. <laughs> see what kind of heresy is that? I don't know. I don't see how you can live in the United States and not pick up a couple of hundred. I came to Atlanta airport one time, saw one of my missionary friends sitting there, just got back from Mexico, and he, sitting, he and his wife were sitting all huddled up against the benches there like they were scared to death. And I said, I'm talking a while. And I said, what's the matter, Brother Hugh? Hugh McCullough is the guy's name. I said, you look kind of scared. He said, don't you feel them? I said, what? He said, the demons in this place. I said, sure I feel them. <laughs> and he said, well, they're not this bad in Mexico. <laughs> I mean, he was huddled up in the Atlanta airport. More demons crawl around there than crawl around Guadalajara. I believe him. I believe him. I think they're there, man. I think between my voice and your ear, there's no telling of what's out there in the air. And if the Holy Spirit doesn't take what I say and get the wax out of your ears and put it in your ear and open your alimentary canal and your station tubes and run that thing down there and get in your heart, I'll never accomplish anything. I can't get it in you. But the Holy Spirit can. All right, he was crying always day and night in the tomb. Notice he'd been bound with chains. And the chains and the fetters have been broken and plucked asunder. I learned something else about demon-possessed people. They have unusual strength. Now, I'm not going to say that every weightlifter is demon-possessed. So some of your brethren carry it too far, you know. And I'm not going to say, you know, that because somebody in the same asylum has to have five people hold them down, it's always demons. I'm not that big a fool. The Bible says comfort those that are feeble-minded. The Bible makes a distinguishment between lunatics and demon possession in Matthew. Not all crazy people have mental uh, spiritual problems. Sometimes it's pathological, so I'm not as dumb as the Catholics, you know. The Catholics, for 1,500 years, everybody was mentally sick. They said it was demon-possessed. They're wrong. Now they're trying to say everybody is mentally sick is just mentally sick, and that's wrong, too. But unusual strength accompanies this kind of thing. You get into advanced karate, and I'm not talking about uh, American Christian form. I believe in that. I've got a karate teacher at my church. Matter of fact, a couple of my karate teachers have shown me some real good katas, you know, and the nunchuck and the, and the cane. I believe in that kind of stuff. I believe every American young man these days should be ready to defend himself 24 hours a day the best way he can, it's as effectively as he possibly can. I believe in that. But you get into real black belt, five, six, seventh Dan Buddhism, you get into some strange stuff. You get these things where the guy stands there and says, you can't lift me off the floor, and you can't lift him off the floor. Down there in Daytona Beach for a year, they had a fellow called Little Moses. And Little Moses had a standing offer of several thousand dollars. Anybody could lift him off the ground when he didn't want to be lifted off the ground. And when he didn't want to be lifted off the ground, you couldn't get him off the ground. And he wouldn't stand on the platform. He'd stand out in the street, the beach, any place else. Charles Atlas and the angel, you know that wrestler, the angel, they liked to tore him apart getting him off the ground. Never did get him off the ground. It's unusual strength. Some of those people in the same asylum, those people are demon control. They're demoniacs. That's the way this fellow was. And always night day, he was in the mountains, listen, crying and cutting himself with stones. One of the marks of demon possession is excessive crying. It's perfectly natural for you to want to cry at the loss of a loved one or some terrible tragedy in your life. It's perfectly all right for you to weep over lost souls. Paul said, I have continual sorrow in my heart. I could wish myself a curse of my kinsmen according to the flesh and that kind of thing. But the same apostle said, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice and rejoice always. And weep for those that weep and rejoice for those that rejoice. And the same apostle said, if you lose a loved one, you sorrow not as others that have no hope. You better look out this this crying jags that run days, weeks, and months at a time. Some of you ladies have them. You better check on them and see something spiritual back in there. 
And he says, cutting himself with stones. What's that? Self-mutilation. Self-abuse, they call it. Slow suicide. Some people do it this way. We used to call them coffin nails. You know you're killing yourself when you do it. But you get pleasure out of it. This fellow got pleasure cutting himself with stones. You call that, that's a masochism. You get pleasure out of hurting yourself. You know anybody that does that? Did you ever go to the Philippines around Lent? Did you ever go to Spain around Easter? You ought to travel around, broaden your mind, broaden your education. I've seen them going down Manila, whipping themselves in the back, and the blood running off the back. Go down to Guadalajara, Madrid, watch them crawl up the steps of the cathedral and back down, they got blood in the knees. You know what they're trying to do? They're trying to pay for the sins. Your blood isn't good enough to pay for your sins. Amen. If you shed every drop of blood you got in your body, you couldn't pay for any of your sins. Because your blood's no good. Amen. you got to have pure blood. You ain't got it. You ain't got it. Read about those prophets of Baal back there, those prophets of Baal. They're out there crying and cutting themselves with lances and knives till the blood gushed out on them. First Kings chapter 17 and 18. And Elijah's there mocking them, making fun of them. My God, what an uncouth character. In the middle of a religious service. <laughs> They're praying. They're praying. Yeah, what's the matter? Can't you get your prayer through? Ha, ha, ha. Some kind of religion you got. Ha. <laughs> Call upon your God. That's some God. Oh, my stars, man. What an unsavory character. <laughs> Listen, the Bible said he mocked them. Amen. Mocked them. What a thing, man. Some of you thin-skinned Christians, you, you know, you've got all kinds of problems. But did you ever think about this? Did you ever think about this? When Jesus Christ showed up, why'd they mistake him for Elijah? Being the kind of character Elijah was. You know the three fellows they mistook him for? Elijah, Jeremiah, and John the Baptist. Why, you never met three more uncouth, vulgar, roughnecks in all your life in that bunch. Why this Jesus, these PTL people are giving you, that isn't Jesus Christ. Yeah. Nobody would mistake their Jesus Christ for Elijah. Yeah, right. hey, call your God, go on the hunting trip. Ah, da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right in the middle of mass. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, boy. I mean, Christ shows up and they said, who do, who do you men say that I am? And one says, you're Elijah. One says, Jeremiah. One says, John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Altar call. Come down to get baptized. Don't come down here unless you've got fruits, meat for repentance. You come down to get baptized. You serpents, you generation of vipers. God don't need you. He can get kids out of those stones. They thought Christ was like that. Boy, he must have been a rough neck, I'll tell you. They sure didn't think he was Isaiah, you know. They thought he was Elijah, crying and cutting himself with stones, and all his night and day in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Come on down there about verse 6 and 7. Verse 6, 7, when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran, he ran and worshipped him. And he says to Jesus, what have I, he cried with a loud voice, Jesus, thou son of the most high God, what am I to do with thee? I adjure thee by God, thou torment me not. For he said to him, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. Now, you see that passage right there? He ran and worshipped him, and he cried with a loud voice. A loud voice, one of the marks of deemed possession. You say, you've got a pretty good loud voice. Yeah, I do. I do. Having a loud voice also a mark of being filled with the Holy Spirit. When Elizabeth met Mary there in Luke chapter 1, she said with a loud voice, Blessed be, so forth and so on. You say, well, if they're both the same, how can I tell the difference? You've got to get in that book to tell the difference. Yeah. Deemed possessed people are marked, marked to have characteristic marks mainly by two things, their voice and their eyes. You say, why is that? Because the light of the body is the eye. Deemed possessed people have two kinds of eyes. One eye goes like this. It pops and stares. They say, Fulton Sheen has such magnetic eyes. Yes, he does. Yes. <laughs> Did you ever see a snake charm a bird? The other eye is like this, it droops. Well, Brother Ruffman, I just thank God I'm, I'm uh, one of the elect by the sovereign <laughs> grace of God. 
And I think that a sovereign God gave me a sovereign grace. Uh huh, yeah, he bugs. <laughs> I'm not saying that because some of you sleep here this morning. I know some of your eyelids are drooping, but I mean they're like that all the time. The eyelids are half shut like that. You ever see that thing? Do you ever notice when a, full of, a fellow gets full of demons, something goes wrong with his, with his way of talking? Do you, you ever hear these charismatics? Have you got the Holy Ghost? Have you got the Holy Ghost? You got the Holy Ghost. What do you mean the Holy Ghost? You mean the Holy Ghost? Oh, the Holy Ghost. Isn't that peculiar? <laughs> This brother said he got Church of Christ preachers all over Tennessee. I'd know a Church of Christ preacher if I heard him anywhere. They all have the same intonation and inflection and diction. And so we see that we should repent and be baptized. For we read in Mark 16, 16, if we baptize, he be bup, 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 bup. Hey, stupid, can't you say baptized? Bup, 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 bup. When they, when they go wrong, something goes wrong with their speech. Did you ever hear a hyper-dispensationalist talk? I'm one of these fellows who doesn't believe baptisms for this age, you know. I wouldn't turn around in church the other night giving me some stuff about, you know, nobody baptized and baptism up. I know that bunch. That J.C. O'Hare, Cornelius Stam, Baker, and Bullinger. I finished that stuff 30 years back. And they come on there and they say, well, you need to belong to the church of the one body. The church of the one body. The church of the one body. The church of the one body? What is that? There's no church of the one body in the Bible. There's the body which is at the church. There's his church, which is the body, but not the church of the one body. The church of the one body, something goes wrong with the boys. Amen, amen. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. I had one preacher one time down Gulfport, Mississippi. His name is J. Charles Jessup. He was saying, so friends, I uh, bless God, uh, Moses, uh, I went up in the mountain, uh, and God did God, uh, when he got up on top of the mountain, I uh, bless God, uh, he got the 12 commandments, and uh, he took the 12 commandments, uh, and I uh, glory to God. And listen, and listen. <laughs> If you're not prepared to preach, you've got to fill in with all that stuff because you ain't got nothing to say. Yes, <laughs> and pretty soon you're saying, and there he was a burning in hell, praise the Lord, and screaming for a glass of water, glory to God. Oh, shut up, you fool, get off the radio. <laughs> and he, I heard him preaching away, and he says, and my friends, uh, there he was, uh, a blessed God, uh, standing at the white throne judgment, uh, and uh, our time is up until the same time next week. This is Jake Carl's <laughs> 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 Now listen, that is natural, man. That is natural. I mean, when God saves a fellow, he doesn't make your diction, your inflection, your voice like every other man. God preserves your individual character. That's why some of us are so obnoxious. <laughs> I had a colored preacher up in, in, in Cincinnati, Ohio. He really put it good. He said, you may be able to choose your friend, but you can't choose your family. <laughs> well, that's simple. I'm in the family of God. Amen. I am your brother in Christ. Amen. Whether you like it or not. <laughs> That's such a comforting thought to me. <laughs> Think about what happened, you know, and Porter and Christ and Martin up at Tennessee Temple, you know, and old the yo ho down at Yoo or whatever his name is down there in Pentecostal Christian School and Neil and Pinocean and Wisdom and Custer and Bob Jones, all these fellows sit down cussing Ruckman out behind my back to their students, and we're in the same family. We'll have a family get together one of these days. <laughs> oh, and he ran to worship Jesus. You notice if he ran to worship him, he was what I told you he was. He was a fundamentalist. And he cried with a loud voice, Jesus, thou son of the most high God, I adjure thee with God, thou torment me not. Where he said, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. Now there was nigh to the place where he was feeding a great herd of swine. And the unclean spirit besought him that they might enter into them. And forthwith he gave them leave. And they went out, entered into the herd of swine. And they ran down a steep place into the sea and were choked. That's what happened when you drown. You choke. You choke on water. They were choked. I heard a preacher say they done committed hogicide. <laughs> I heard a country preacher say one time that's the first case of deviled ham in the Bible. <laughs> and down they went and ran down the steep place into the sea and they were drowned they were drowned now, isn't that something isn't that something the devil's second choice is a hog my what an unflattering thing what an uncomplimentary thing can't you see me preaching that in the first United Methodist Church of Rochester Sunday morning if the devil couldn't get you he'd get a hog <laughs> Oh, boy, would you offend those folks. Who oh, ever heard the lie? Oh, I don't know. Where did he come from? Who is he, you know? 
Oh, yeah, man. Well, they came out and they went to a hog. They went to a hog. Sam Jones, the old-time Methodist preacher, used to preach four and five weeks without giving an invitation. And some of his cooperating board said to him after about four weeks, Sam, aren't you ever going to give an invitation? And he said, I don't want to scrape the bristles off my hogs. I'll get them soaked in boiling water. <laughs> amen, brother. Amen, amen. That's how I look at those things. I don't always give an invitation to my church. I sure don't, brother. I preach sometimes, just turn them loose. Like I'm doing this morning. It's more of the same. Brother Grace wants to give invitation to okay, but I'm just going to lay it on you, boy. Let it sit and simmer. Simmer. We're too big a hurry, I'm telling you. We're too big a hurry. I'm going to sit there and let God just pound and drill and dynamite and root and stomp and blast. When a preacher don't get you, the next one will. That's good, man. That's good. I like where preachers get about each one of them just corrects the other guy for the mistake he made. <laughs> that way you get balanced. See? And that way all the rocks get turned over. And after a while all the bugs get stomped on. Including the beetles. <laughs> All right, keep on reading. So they went out and they went into the swine. The swine ran down a steep place in the sea, about 2,000, and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled. Went in the country and the city round about and told what had taken place. And they came out to see it. That'll, that'll get you a big crowd. Coming out to see what happened to a demon-possessed fellow that got saved. I wish God had saved more men in this country than what he does. Back in the days of Billy Sunday and Dwight L. Moody, all the converts were over 20 years old, most of them over 30. Then during the days of Billy Graham and Youth for Christ, they began to get around, down around 20 and 16, 17 and 18. The last 10, 20 years of this country has been child evangelism. Five, six, seven, eight, and nine. I'm not deriding that. I know, save a life. I, I know all that. I, I, you don't know a cliche. I don't know. Believe me. But I wish God would get some doctors and lawyers and bankers and some big thugs and just knock them down and show them what he showed me. He can do it. He can do it. He can do it. And we, you've heard all this week why he hadn't done it. And I, I buy it. I buy it. I buy everything that's been said. I know why he doesn't do it. I'll show you why here in a minute in this passage right here. But I wish he would. I like to see the kids saved. I like to see the ladies saved. I'd rather see the head of the house saved. When the old man gets saved, then there's more chance than the rest of them get saved. And you take that fellow right there, they came out to see him. They said, boy, you never saw him like us for in your life. They not some just, you ever think what a privilege some of you folks have to come to this church here and get on this, this bad attitude Baptist blowout? I'm just thinking an opportunity you have to look at me. <laughs> the greatest freak in the 20th century. You'll go back and I say, I've seen him, I've seen, I've seen the devil himself. That tears up all these churches and cause all this trouble and doing more harm to the cause of Christ than him in America. Step right this way, ladies and gentlemen. Step by the big tent. See him just inside. Half man, half human. Three quarters in between. Half animal. Never accused of a persuading human being. Born Africa with a veil over his face. Step right the little boy for a color cop. Step right this way. Ten cents, only one tenth of a dollar. We sent his pissage into for a picture into Ripley and they sent us a note back and said, we don't believe it. <laughs> You know what I am? I'm just an old maniac of Gadara that got saved, boy. Yeah. Let me tell you, man, I am sitting. I'm resting where Mary was at the feet of Jesus to get his word. And I'm sitting. And I'm clothed, brother, clothed in my right mind. Folks, all oh, you're nuts. You know what you're talking about. You're nuts. <laughs> and if I am nuts, nuts, nuts are gone, you squirrels be up a tree, man. You won't, you won't have nothing. <laughs> Right mind, you're in your wrong mind. No man gets in his right mind. He gets rightly related to God. Keep on reading down there. They came out and saw him that had been possessed with the devil, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed, and in his right mind, and they were what? Isn't that peculiar? Why should they be afraid? Wouldn't show thought they said, praise God, glory to God. He got that maniac straightened out. Now our kids can pass through here without getting worried about getting their head beat off with chains or getting rocks thrown at them. Jesus, won't you stay around a while and come home and deal with my husband? He's a drunk. And won't you come home and save my wife? She's been stepping. Wouldn't you thought they'd have begged him to stay? And they were afraid, next verse, and they prayed for him to depart out of their coast. Isn't that something? 
You know what happened? They came out there and looked around and says, this the guy? Yes, the guy. Boy, I'm sure happened to him. Yeah. Got to shave, sit down there, feet of Jesus, study the Bible, cleaned up, got clothes on. So I'm sure happened to him. Well, where are the hogs? Down the bay. Down the bay? Yeah, how many? 2,000 head. 2,000 head. Let's see, pork, dollar, eight, nine cents a pound. 2,000. Man, you're expensive, boy. We can't keep you around here. That's it. You know what people do? They count the cost, decide it ain't worth it. You slide this cat, quit sin. You quit all the sins you want to quit. You Christian, quit the ones you want to quit and keep the ones you want to keep. Oh, it's a terrible thing to say, isn't it? It's the truth. It's the truth. God Almighty, the Holy Spirit, has been hanging over this country for about 10, 20 years now, maybe 40, and saying, you want revival? And we said, yes, Lord, we want revival. Why, it isn't a lack of prayer. You take down south, this brother from Tennessee. I know it goes there, those Southern Baptists. I know. Boy, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, man, they're just like Mormons in Utah. Right. And you get down there, and every year they have the simultaneous revival. Why, there are hundreds of thousands of Baptists praying for revival every year. Right. And have been for 40 years. Where is it? Where is it? On, Something's wrong. Yes, sir. Why, the Fulton Street prayer meeting started with eight people and bought a nationwide revival, you've got 500,000 Baptists praying every March and April. Right. No revival. I'll tell you what's wrong. The Holy Spirit has been brooding over America saying you want revival? Yes. You've got to have revival? Yes. You're concerned about your wife, your children, your family, and the nation? Yes. All right, I'll send you a revival. But this has to go, and that has to go, and that has to go, and that has to go. You know what you Christians have done? You look God in the face and said, God, I just can't live without it. Okay, bud, keep it. Keep it. And see where it gets you. He had to pray from the part out of their coach. But Jesus said they've suffered him not. He wouldn't let him go to the ship. He said, go home and tell thy friends what great thing the Lord hath done for thee and how he hath had compassion upon me. And he departed in the region of the capitalists round about down there in verse 18, 19, and 20 and told what great thing the Lord had done for him and all men did marvel. I bet they did. I bet they did. Anybody knew about that fellow there? Boy, that fellow got converted boys all over the countryside. I bet all men, are, men wondered what in the world had taken place. You don't see enough of that. You see it once in a while. Oh, this summer has been a great summer for me. I don't say much about things like this. I don't talk about much about my soul winning work. Uh, people think, why, well, there's some Christians don't believe that God even give me any soul, a fellow like me. You'd be surprised how many he gives me. You take along about May there, we gave an invitation down there in that church down there, and a woman we've been praying for and dealing with for three years, a full-grown 48-year-old Jewish boy came down that aisle and knelt my wife led her to Christ at the altar. I mean, an Orthodox Jew, man, an Orthodox Jew, married to a Jewish lawyer, brother. I mean, about a week later, I gave the invitation. Here comes a 47-year-old man down there. Bop, the old boy gets saved back the next Sunday. Go off that camp, nine saved here, 36 saved here, 20. Come back home to church, the in-between, give the invitation. Down comes a man about 40 and a woman about 35. That's, it's a great thing. It's a great thing. It just don't happen enough. It don't happen enough. I've seen some things in my day. And I'm getting them near the end right now. I don't kid myself anymore. I try to kid myself, and I'm no good at kidding myself, you know. I can't fool anybody else. Don't try to fool myself. I just ain't as young as I used to be. I mean, I go up to five flights of stairs. That's, that's what, you want to see how young you are, just run up five flights of stairs. And put your hand over here. <laughs> that's how things are going. And you know something, as I get along toward the end of the race here and I put down my armor someday, I'm going to tell you the darn truth. I'm not exaggerating. I wouldn't take a million bucks in cash for God offered to me on that platform right there to give up what God has put me through as a Christian. I mean, the experience I've had in the ministry trying to win men to Christ, I wouldn't take all the money in the world for it. Not even to, not even to help missionaries. It's been too good. It's been too good. Some of you fellows here, some of you fellows here this morning, you know what you're doing? You're just missing the boat. Amen. Honest to God, you're just missing the boat. If I, if I came at you with a carnal motive, and I might, 
it, you ought to be a soul winner if for nothing else just to live an interesting and exciting life. <laughs> amen, 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 amen. I'd like to be spiritual about it, you know, and talk about a burden for souls. Sometimes you don't get a burden for souls till you get out there and try to win them. See? Sometimes you just make yourself go and then get out there and God will catch up with you after you get out there for a while. But if it wasn't that, if it just wasn't that, listen, but what I've seen as a minister in these 35 years, I just wouldn't tell you anything for. You can't see it anywhere. There are no Christian films that are made about the stuff I've seen. Not the stuff I've seen, brother. And the rest of the stuff that's good is second hand. I mean, I'm talking about first hand. I'll give you two and I'll quit. I was preaching one time up in the streets in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Up there we preached in the street every afternoon. Back in those days, I didn't have any sense. I'd just been saved about, oh, about a year. I was green man, green boy. You'd have stuck me in the ground, I'd have rooted. And I was out there between two buildings about as far apart as these walls here and those buildings went up 30 feet in the air. Perfect sounding board. And Highway 29 right down in front of them. I mean, Washington, D.C., the Pensacola, Florida. Didn't have any interstate in those days. I put up my board between those buildings and I'd preach three chalk talk messages every Saturday afternoon without a bullhorn or a mic. But all the time I'd preach three messages with my voice, 40 minutes a message, I'd just be croaking. I go back to school on Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday. It was just <laughs> I couldn't talk. I was out there preaching one day and preaching the crucifixion. I got on the end. And I said, "Now I said, uh, if you've never received Christ your Savior and you're willing to receive Christ your Savior, step forward and take a tract out of my hand." There's all kind of ways to give invitation, you know. And I said, "Step forward, and take a tract out of my hand." And a couple of people kind of moved, and one of them came up, took a tract, went over their side. One of the boys began to deal with him. Another fellow stepped up and reached in his pocket and pulled out a pint of whiskey, about half full, and threw it down the ground, gravel there between the buildings, and before that thing could bounce, another drunk came along, picked it up and put it in his pocket and went off with it. <laughs> and the guy pulled out the whiskey, came up to me and he said, okay, I'm saved, ain't I? I said, I don't know, are you? He said, well, you told me if I'd trust Jesus Christ, put my faith in his shed blood, that'd save me. Is that right? I said, that's right. He said, well, I just did that. Yeah. I said, okay, you're saved. Reach his pocket, pull out a 38, put it on me, just like that. I mean, that'll shake up your day, man. <laughs> Loaded, boy. <laughs> <laughs> like that. And I said, what's, what's that for? He said, well, I was on my way to kill my ex-wife. And he said, just got out of jail. Been in jail for manslaughter. He said, I'm on my way to kill her. He said, uh, I'm not going to kill her. I'm saved now. I want to tell her I got saved. Amen. You take the pistol. Gave me the pistol. Put that guy in the car. Go down the street away where his ex-wife lived. Came up there and knocked the door. Me and the boys sat out in the car and prayed for him. He went up there and knocked at that door and put us in the door open about an inch or something. Night latch on. And we heard voices yelling inside the house. He, this fellow just stood there like this. And after a while we saw the screen door open and his wife wasn't there but his daughter and his son-in-law were there. We saw both of them poke their heads out of the door and look at him like that. He just stood there. He sat there crying. He couldn't say a word. Just tears running down his face. Now from it they said something, you couldn't hear the exchange of words, and I'm telling you, boy, that door opened, and that daughter and that son-in-law stepped out there and put their arms around the other boy, and all three of them knelt in that, that front porch, had a camp meet right out there on the front porch. I wouldn't take a pretty for that, man. You couldn't give me anything for that. You know what I saw a week after that? I was driving through Spartanburg and saw this fellow, his name was Hunsker, Chuck Hunsinger. I came driving through 29, going through Spartanburg, and here he had some guy up against a wall witnessing to him. And he had a dime store, her tail, blue ribbon Bible in his arm. You ever see one of those Bibles? It's a pulpit Bible. The thing is this thick and a foot by a foot. I mean, here. He's like, I I wouldn't take nothing for that, man. You don't find that in any of these little unshackled programs or anything else, man. I've seen that. I've seen that. Some of you guys here, 35, 40, and 45, 50, you don't know what you're missing by not trying to get in that stuff. I wasn't preaching as an ordained minister in a church pulpit. I was out in the street corner. Why don't you get with it? You're missing some stuff. I preached up to Spartanburg one time at a chain gang. And back in those days, they were chain gangs. Now they call them road gangs or road camps or work. I don't know what. You know, with Sissify generation always got a way of telling like it ain't. But it was a chain gang in those days. And we got out there and I preached in that place and preached in that place. And there were a bunch of fellows lying around the bunks there when I came in. And they listened to me. 
all except one big old toe-headed boy, about six feet two, about 300 pounds. He took one look at me and went, <laughs> lay back in his bunk, pulled a funny paper over his face, went to sleep. I went ahead and preached. I had about three professions of faith, and I left, went on about my way. Didn't think anything more about it. Didn't think more about it until about two weeks later. And two weeks later, I was downtown Greenville, passed out tracks at night, and along about uh, 10 o'clock at night, we decided we'd done enough and wanted to go on home. So we started on home, and we got up to the park where the car was parked, and one of the young men said to me, there's a friend of yours over here in the park sleeping out in the park. I said, what do you mean? He said, he said he knows you. Well, I said, well, what about him? He said, well, he wants to know if you can get him in the rescue mission to sleep tonight. I said, is he drunk? He said, a little bit drunk. I said, well, they won't give him a room down in the mission if he's drunk. Maybe we can drive around and sober him up go get him. So we went across the park, and pretty soon up across the hill in that park, I saw this big old fella come, big old toe-headed fella, about 300 pounds. He came up, walked up the car, looked down, and he said, you remember me? <laughs> I said, no, I don't know you from Adam. Who are you? So I'm Whitey Woods. And I said, I don't know you. So I know you. He said, you preached me up there in jail, he said, last week. And he said, I didn't treat you right, preacher. So my mom is a Christian. My dad is a Christian. I was raised to have better manners. I should have listened to you. And I said, that's okay. Can't win them all. What do you want to have us do for you? He said, could you get me in the mission? I said, okay, get in the car. We got him in the car. We started on down to the mission, got him some black coffee and tomato juice, you know, and going to try to work him in. And in the car, sitting there, he was sitting between me and another kid in the back seat. We were shoved up against the wall. Like I had shores, you know, bang on the doorway getting through there. <laughs> and I talked to him about the Lord, talked to him about his soul. He was on the save. He listened real careful. And he agreed to everything. And finally, after about 15 minutes of it, he said, well, okay, preacher. And he bowed his head there and prayed and prayed the sinner's prayer, asked God to save him. When I lead a band of Christ, always pray, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Now, that may not be good, you know, Baptist doctrine, but it's safe. I mean, I mean, get the fish in the boat and gaff him and knock his brains out, and then he'll stay in the boat. <laughs> and so I said, fill him with the Spirit. And he said, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we went on down the mission. We got down there, and they wouldn't take him. We got back in the car, and he sobered up pretty good, I thought. And we'd drive along there in the car, and I said, tell you what. I said, I got a place out behind my trailer out there in the trailer court, and not much of a place, but it's a warm spring night, and there are no mosquitoes or flies out yet. I'll make you a pound out there. You can sleep out there tonight. He said, well, thank you. So we drove along there at about a 25-minute drive back to school, and we drove along there, and after about 15 minutes driving the car, the old boy sitting between us, and he went, <laughs> you know, well, go on, man. <laughs> he goes, <laughs> like that. And I said, what's the matter? He said, it took, it took. <laughs> he said, you know, preacher, it took. I said, what took? I forgot, you know, but then, so what took? He said, that prayer I prayed, it took. <laughs> And that guy opened his mouth. You couldn't shut him up. He hadn't hardly said five words. And he just blabbered all the way back to that trailer court. I mean, my mama's up in Southern Carolina. My daddy's up there. And they've been praying for me, you know, for 30 years. I'm going back to my mama. She's got a Christian boy. And preaching you to know what I've been through. And start talking about I've been in jail. And I've been out of jail here. And the cops got me here. I was beat up here. And I hurt this fellow. Just blabbed all the way back to the place. We got back to the trader court, and I made him a pallet out there, and I took him a Bible. I said, now, when you leave in the morning, take this Bible with you. I flashlight in the blanket, but take the Bible with you. <laughs> oh, yeah, man, they'll hock it for a drink, man. And I said, take it with you when you go. And he said, okay. And I started to go. You know what old Whitey Wood said to me? He said, preacher, he said, how do you pray? I said, me how do you pray? He said, well, teach me how to pray. I said, well, you just talk to God like I'm talking to you. And he said, well, show me. Well, they put you on the spot sometimes. I came to the guy's house about a year ago in Pensacola. When I walked in the door, he came up to me crying and I said, Pete, show me Jesus. You ever have that one put on you? Show me Jesus. <laughs> I just happened to have a track in my back pocket called Tell It Like It Is, and I whipped it out and had a picture of Christ crucified right there in color. Good thing I had it on me. And it came in there, <laughs> came in there, and this, this fella, he says, tell me how to pray. So I said, well, just talk to God like you're talking to me. He said, well, show me. I said, okay. I said, Father, I need some help right now. I need some food and clothes. I want you out and pay a bunch of stuff for it. Went back and laid down my trailer. That must have been 11.30 at night. And at 12.30 in the morning when I went to sleep, I could hear that little boy out in the bushes talking to God just as fast as he could talk. 
Lord this and Lord that. Lord, you know this and Lord, I need this and Lord this stuff. At 12.30, I got about 7.30, went out there and Whitey Wood was gone. He left the pillar. He left the blanket. He left the flashlight. Well, one thing he took, that Bible. Let me tell you, that fellow went back to Carolina and told what great things the Lord had done for him. All men did marvel. I wouldn't trade experience like that for all the money on this earth. All right, Father, bless the message this morning. May the Holy Spirit of God speak to your children here this morning. This most of your people here today. Just show them what they're missing. That's all, Lord. I can't, I can't tell them. Just, you just show them. They just miss so much of life by not, by not enjoying these kind of things. And you've been so good to us and given us so many richly, so many things richly that money couldn't buy. And, and there's no way to obtain these things except in your service and your work. And Lord, I pray you put your hand on some man in this building this morning if he's unsaved. And get him by the nap of the neck and the seat of the britches and shake him over hell and get the devils out of him and clean the demons out of him and unclean spirits. Make him fit to live with. And Lord, if there's some Christian man here up in years that does know the excitement and the thrill of the great adventure of witnessing for Christ, give him the courage he needs to do it. And I pray it in Jesus' name.